Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. My dear student, Assalamu alaikum. Today we are going to talk about postmodern criticism. As we took a start with the, uh, the definition of postmodernism, and then we differentiated between postmodernism and modernism, and then we talked about some of the theorists uh, uh, from postmodernism, and then. Uh, so my dear students, uh, uh, and then we covered the novelists during the postmodern era and then uh, some of the dramatists as well. Today we are going to talk about postmodern criticism. Okay, This is your lecture number 29 and the class is History of English Literature, Comsars Virtual Campus, Islamabad. Okay, my dear students, uh, as you know that I gave you the briefing about postmodernism, and then uh, we do a comparison between modernism and postmodernism, like how these two approaches are different from each other. Okay, so postmodernism is, uh, you can say, anti-modernism as well. So, my dear students, uh, here basically uh, we are talking about postmodern criticism, as I told you, like. Uh, Criticism took an entirely a new look uh, in postmodernism. Okay, why? Because uh, here this is uh, you can say the element of intertextuality are very much present there. Subjective reality is there, and uh, ways of looking at uh, uh, you know reality those are very much different over here. Okay, previously everything was uh, being measured on the basis of scientific formulas and rules in the modern period. Okay the effect of science on literature as well. So my dear students, basically this is a discussion on post-modern criticism. So I'll just quickly tell you some of the things relevant to post-modernism once more, okay? So basically when you talk about post-modernism, what is this? This is an artistic, architectural, philosophical and cultural movement or condition set to arise after and in reaction to modernism. So my dear students, Postmodernism is not a movement which is just restricted to literature only. It is about culture, it is about uh, architecture, this is about art, okay, for example, about painting, music, everything, okay. Like they basically uh, rejected the previous view of uh, looking at the things and uh, you can say about the realities, about objectivist point of view, okay, like uh, you cannot uh, judge anything on the basis of scientific formulas only, okay, element of subjectivity are very much present there and the power relations which are working behind uh, producing any kind of uh, literature or any painting as well. So what are basically the influencing factors which are involved in the production of uh, anything those are very much important according to post uh, modernism okay according to many commentators whereas modernism frames itself as the culmination of the enlightenment's quest for an authoritatively rational aesthetics ethics and knowledge so when you talk about the characteristics of uh, modernism so according to some of the commentators only we are not generalizing it everywhere some only few people talked about this like this is basically about enlightenment this is about uh, you can say rational okay like uh, uh, when you talk about uh, you know scientific formulas or the advancements of science so you could see like the formulas which are being practiced in west so those are similar in east as well so here when you talk about literature or about you can say language so according to postmodernism this is not true like uh, changes are there in equal relationships of power are there okay so postmodernism is concerned with the, how the authority of those would be ideals so here Postmodernism tries to, you know, uh, find out the answers of these kind of questions, like uh, what basically is the reason of any kind of uh, authority, any kind of uh, power, okay? So, what are the factors which are involved in giving that authority, that power, okay? Sometimes called meta narratives uh, are subverted through fragmentation, consumerism, and deconstruction. So these are some of the ten terminologies which are relevant to postmodern literature. Okay, dear students, what you have to do over here is like uh, while analyzing postmodern uh, literature or postmodern criticism, like what was basically the viewpoint uh, uh, against it. So simple is that you'll have to go against the modern doctrines of uh, looking at literature of looking at reality okay looking at power relation at that time everything was equal okay so basically uh, modernists they did not talk about the differences or about positives uh, or inequal relations of power 
for example when you talk about uh, men and women in society so their roles are different uh, their expectations uh, uh, you can say from the society those are different and uh, the opportunities are also different so this uh, it comes uh, under post modernism when they talk about something which is uh, not absent okay in relation to what is present okay so they go for what is hidden and uh, you can say they then they analyze what is uh, apparent okay so my dear students here you can see the deeper analysis of uh, the things is uh, very much essential okay they just do not go for the surface level meaning previously like uh, you can judge you can infer meaning on the basis of a uh, dictionary only so here like it depends upon your experience upon the context in which you are saying the things uh, upon any kind of uh, you can say situation any particular event that was happening in the society plus uh, uh, readers information is also very much impor important in inferring the meaning so uh, you can say totally new concept towards uh, generating or creating the meanings over here you can see okay so dear students basically when you talk about post modernism or b what was basically their philosophy so you could see over here like they were uh, you can say quoted towards uh, the figurative meaning okay figurative meaning or the hidden meaning basically they were uh, you can say mm, uh, uh, very much against the denotational meanings of the words okay so like there are uh, there is a possibility of as many interpretations as many readers you have so this was basically the concept okay features of post modern culture begin to raise in uh, raise in the 1920s with the emergence of the dada movement so basically this was a moment and at that time you could see uh, the features they were taking uh, uh, place in england and uh, this was a story of uh, in 1920s okay which uh, featured a uh, collag and a focus on the framing of objects and discourse as uh, being as important or more important than the work itself so by b my dear students basically you could see over here the importance of uh, discourse okay as compared to work for example if you are writing any kind of uh, poem so work is not as such as such important but the discourse the language in use the language in action that is very much important so let me clarify this concept with uh, an example for example when you uh, say um, uh, you can say uh, policeman discourse okay or uh, you can say the institutional discourse or the or court discourse so definitely you could see like uh, some of the dominating personalities for example in court judges Mm, judges having the power on the other hand those people who would go there uh, in order to defend their cases over there so definitely they are less privileged people the power is in the hands of the authority who is basically the judge so the personality of judge is not important basically the power behind uh, his institution is very much important everybody has to follow his or her decisions okay so the, basically this was uh, an important aspect like you are not focusing on the work basically the power which is hidden that is of discourse that is of language in use language in action okay when you talk about uh, medical discourse in hospital setting uh, settings so my dear students here you can say like a uh, doctor is the one who has the authority who has the power on the other hand uh, uh, patient they are the less privileged people as far as hospital is concerned okay so definitely the kind of language uh, the right uh, sorry the doctors use in the hospital that is very much important that's the hospital and uh, that's the hospital setting and you could see the power is in the hands of the authorities who are working in hospital on the other hand uh, when you talk about teacher and student discourse definitely the teacher is on the higher position and the discourse is being controlled by the uh, teacher okay although the discourse is a uh, uh, university discourse for example or college discourse but that is being controlled by the teacher so post modernism tries to find out the questions or the you can say the hidden power which is behind that course having that institutional power like uh, in uh, hospital settings as i told you the power is in the hands of the doctor so what basically are the factors which uh, gave that power to the doctor on the other hand teacher student discourse what, what are the factors which are involved in giving power to the 
teacher okay so it depends upon the status uh, or you can say upon um, the factors uh, you can say uh, might be your education is also very much involved your status is involved so dear students by focusing on the what is basically behind this course uh, will go you can say for analyzing post modern criticism okay like uh, here this is uh, an uh, this is a reaction uh, you can say against uh, modernism okay like the whatever doctrines uh, modern uh, writers they were following this is a kind of revolution against all those thoughts okay the basic element is they challenged objectivity they challenged uh, you can say uh, like uh, everything is equal in society they challenged these kind of thoughts and they go for binary oppositions uh, the concept which is given by Derrida okay like wh why this is male and female okay so why why not female first and then male so here my dear students by analyzing language by analyzing discourse uh, you can go through uh, uh, for finding out the reasons uh, behind uh, working any kind of discourse okay Another strand which would have tremendous impact on postmodernism would be the existentialists, uh, who place the centrality of the individual narrative as being the source of morals and understanding. However, it is with the end of the Second World War that recognizably postmodernist attitude began to emerge. So, my dear students, this postmodern uh, you can say philosophy uh, took its place uh, you know after the second world war okay so here you can see like uh, they focused on individual narrative okay like uh, that's on the central position it's not like uh, um, my dear students uh, you you can see here like the element of subjectivity is very much present when we talk about individual narrative okay so that is the uh, the viewpoint of exist existentialism as well okay so when you talk about postmodern uh, attitude so it took uh, uh, you can say it's uh, both in uh, after the Second World War. Okay, the reaction uh, on the modern literature plus on the modern thoughts. Okay, so here you'll have to judge everything on the basis of subjectivity, on the basis of uh, you can say uh, critical thinking of creativity. So you are not here to uh, go with the trends of the society as they are. So my dear students, you can say like we are giving more liberty to the writers uh, over here and to the readers as well because they can interpret the meaning in whatever way they want to basically that like uh, it gives uh, rise to interpretation of the text as well central to these is the focusing on the problems of any knowledge which is founded or anything external to an individual postmodernism while widely diverse in its forms almost invariably uh, begins from the problem of knowledge which is both broadly disseminated in its form but not limited to its interpretation so my dear students here we do not have a limited interpretation of anything it depends again I'm telling you it depends upon the individual upon his or her subjective opinion the way he or she interprets the thing okay so this is you can say diversity in knowledge as well diversity in uh, options and in interpretations you could see over here okay so my dear students uh, we are not just restricting ourselves to any particular kind of form as far as postmodernism is concerned it is not only text which is important but uh, the formulation of text is very much important it depends upon your interpretation and one more thing uh, which I told you previously as well this is like uh, they do not go for the dictionary meaning as such like anything which is static which is set they were quite against it okay so the basic focus was on subjectivity was on interpretation okay postmodernism has manifestations in many modern academic and non-academic disciplines for example philosophy theology art, architecture, film, television, music, theater, sociology, fashion, technology, literature and communications are all heavily influenced by postmodern trends and ideas and are thoroughly scrutinized from postmodern perspectives. So my dear students here we are not just talking about postmodernism as far as literature is concerned it has its impact on uh, philosophy, on theology, on art, on architecture, even on television, music. So everything uh, got changed uh, with the arrival of post to modernism so the perspective was basically changed like the way of looking at the things the way of looking at the reality that was a change so here my dear students 
a challenge to objectivity, a challenge to science over here. Like you cannot judge all the things on the basis of scientific formula, scientific rules. Uh, okay, so here it would definitely, uh, you know, affect. Uh, language plus literature so how far language is being affected by it like they uh, here you you could see language is quite flexible okay as far as the meanings are concerned you can have a rich variety of meanings based on the interpretation of uh, the readers okay or of the listeners as well so my dear students uh, here you can say like it would entirely change the concept of uh, criticism as as well uh, in the history of English literature so everything like a film is also or you can say music uh, these these domains are also in very much uh, uh, you can say influenced by post modern philosophy okay because uh, Again, I'm telling you, fo by focusing on subjectivity, by focusing on flexibility, or uh, by focusing on you know different dimensions and on many interpretations, you can see uh, an entirely a new trend in the history of English literature that is known as postmodernism. Okay, so here, my dear students, we will focus on postmodern criticism today. So, my dear students, uh, when we talk about uh, criticism in the history of English literature, so, uh, dear students, uh, there are certain phases, okay? So, uh, you know, we'll talk about all those phases in detail as well. But the point over here is what basically postmodern criticism is. Uh, if we talk about criticism individually, so that is an activity, that is an active activity, you can say, or uh, that is, uh, you can say, your judgment about something, your analysis of something. Previously, before postmodernism you can say uh, philosophy you could see uh, people used to take uh, criticism as a, a kind of negative thing okay like a negative activity which is just to highlight uh, the negative aspects of any literary kind of work so when we talk about postmodern literature over here so here you will see a variety of uh, approaches which are emerged over here because that's uh, quite uh, a free kind of uh, approach or a liberal approach as well because uh, there is a margin of uh, interpretation of uh, looking at the realities from different ways. So basically we talk about uh, the unequal relationships of power and equality in uh, uh, you know, society as far as uh, you can say both the genders are concerned. Uh, when we talk about economical issues uh, like so the unequal distribution of wealth uh, among different classes of society. So here my dear students we, we won't just focus on the surface level meaning or you can say the apparent reality. We definitely will have have to go into the deeper reality the facts which are involved there in uh, you know distributing power relations or you can say distributing money among different classes of society so my dear students uh, these are this is the broader view of a postmodernism so far we have discussed so uh, when we uh, move towards you can say post uh, postmodern criticism what basically that criticism is so you'll get to know about many other things and and the concept would be quite clear to you so so far you could see over here like uh, this is basically a, a discussion on postmodern uh, literature as a whole okay and uh, with the passage of time you'll see like when you uh, you'll analyze uh, different literary works so you could see like these uh, approaches and these concepts would be very beneficial to you because uh, you just have to concentrate on uh, the overall doctrine of the society of writing literature or you can say the thoughts which are very much common uh, during any particular era so the things would be quite uh, easy for you let me tell you uh, uh, an example of it for example if you want to analyze uh, a novel that is written in modern period on the other hand you just have to compare that novel with the post modern novel so my dear students uh, here you'll find out the differences like what was basically the concept be behind writing a novel during the me uh, modern period and how far that trend is different uh, in the postmodern era so here you'll see a lot of interpretations are there a lot of subjective elements are there so it would be very easy for you to uh, find out the autobiographical elements uh, from any kind of work plus uh, you can show your own creativity as well so later on if you are criticizing anything so later on it would be 
be very you can say easy for the future researchers or future future writers or readers to uh, look at your autobiographical elements while analyzing the things so here my dear students uh, that is your interpretation about reality so you are not just restricted to comment on anything or not to comment on anything here nothing is uh, you can say static nothing is inflexible you can have a margin of uh, interpretation of uh, uh, you can say generalizing the meaning as far as your individual personality is concerned my dear students uh, until uh, the time of the modernist period of uh, english uh, literature literary criticism was a literary activity with leading call them policy documents written by the leaders of the literary movements so uh, my dear students until the modern period you could see like uh, that was just a literary activity like a literary essays or the kind of you know um, different uh, you can say uh, books which are written by the uh, you know literary critics of that time that was just known as criticism until the period of uh, you know modernism okay we know how from dryden and pope and johnson to wordsworth and coleridge and keats to arnold and rossetti and swinburne to eliot and auden and uh, spander english poetry was theorized by the leading english poet here i just want to give you a, a kind of revision to the previous sessions as well like uh, when we were talking about uh, you know dryden and pope and then we moved towards you know uh, johnson and then towards uh, wordsworth so these are the romantic poets okay and different you know modern poets for example so and the novelists as well so my dear students uh, like uh, these were uh, you know different poets and novelists you know in different era so up till you know uh, the modern period we were just uh, you know able to uh, you know know about them like what are basically their literary works okay but the post modern period there is no such thing as literary theory no any of the dominant uh, theoretic documents of today's activity of criticism has come from any men of letters it is mostly the philosophers sociologists anthropologists psychologists linguists etc who have propounded all kinds of uh, dismantling orders which are being applied by the by their followers in the field of literature today the activity called theory is related to not any particular subject but to all subjects so my dear students here previously you could see like that was just literary theory like whenever anybody wanted to give any kind of theory so that was a kind of literary theory so my dear students here theory is not just restricted to literature now in the post modern era so anything that is uh, you know that can be relevant to any subject so this is not just uh, restricted to literature over here all right so previously like uh, you could see like any kind of uh, you know so today any document any theoretical kind of uh, you know dominant document of today's activity of criticism has come from uh, any uh, men of letters so basically this is not just restricted to men of letters only or anybody who is a, a kind of scholar or philosopher who can give any kind of uh, theory in literature only so basically my dear students here the point is that before you know post modernism uh, you could see like a theory was just a literary theory like lit based on literature so my dear students here you can see like it can be relevant to any subject so for the very first time in the post modern era you could see like a theoretical foundation you can give uh, to any kind of a subject and that is not uh, just uh, limited to uh, literary studies only okay no wonder the literary criticism today has become cultural studies feminism post colonialism etc which use literary texts for making political sociological or psychological case studies as jonathan culler has attempted to explain the nature of theory so i'll explain uh, uh, you know his uh, nature of theory in the next slide so my dear students uh, let me define something uh, over here like uh, today it, in this world literary criticism has become cultural study so my dear students it is part of culture it is part of uh, feminism it is a part of colonialism as well so my dear students like uh, after post modernism or during the post modernism era you could see like uh, there was a tradition of uh, uh, you know uh, criticizing the works of other people as well okay that is why it gave rise to critical thinking in the society okay okay uh, now i'll explain uh, color uh, uh, you know um, example uh, of the nature of theory 
Theory in literary studies is not an account of the nature of literature or methods of study. It is a body of thinking and writing whose limits are exceedingly hard to define. A new kind of writing has developed which is neither an evaluation of the relative merits of literary pr productions, nor intellectual history, nor moral philosophy, nor social prophecy, but all of these mingled together in a new genre. So my dear students, here we are going to touch another aspect of criticism here in the postmodern era. So this is not just restricted to one you know, particular domain or genre, like for example, literary productions or literary history only, or moral philosophy or social uh, prophecy. My dear students, here you can see a mixture of all the genres, okay? So all the genres are mingled together over here in theory in the postmodern era, okay? The most convenient designation of this miscellaneous uh, genre is simply the nickname theory, okay? which has come to designate works that succeed in challenging and reorienting thinking in fields other than those to which they apparently belong. This is the simplest explanation of what makes something count as theory. Works regarding as theory have effects beyond their original fields. Okay, my dear students, here you could see the interdisciplinary approach to the study of a theory over here because this is not just restricted to its uh, own field because it, uh, you know, uh, it is not just uh, a restricted study of something. So it, uh, it definitely would affect, uh, you know, uh, beyond the original fields. Okay, my dear students, so this is the definition of uh, theory according to color okay so my dear students here you can see like the interdisciplinary approach uh, the, uh, towards the study of theory over uh, overall uh, you know concept of theory you could see over here and uh, you know the things which are involved in the formulation of theory so my dear students you could see over here okay that's the main effect that's the main effect of theory is disputing all that we have been considering common sense it questions all the concepts and beliefs we have held about literature, author, reader, text, meaning, etc. It questions as well the new literary concepts of philosophy, sociology, and linguistics. Basically, my dear students, here we are talking about the main effect of uh, theory that is disputing all th that we have been considering common sense. So, my dear students, here when we put something uh, uh, in, you know, in form of a proper, we give it a proper shape, so that is known as a theory. The, the, the common sense or the common, uh, you know, uh, assumptions or the common knowledge which we have stored in our minds. So, when we put it together uh, as a whole uh, in the form of, you know, any work, so that, that is known as theory. It questions all the concepts and beliefs. So basically it does not question only one concept or only one belief. It questions everything. We have held about literature so all the beliefs, all the you can say concepts relevant to uh, literature, author, reader, text, meaning etc. So everything. So a theory covers basically all the things. It covers author, reader, text, meaning and literature as well. So basically, it does not just deal with the literary aspects of literature only, rather it goes for the no literary concepts as well. For example, philosophy, sociology, linguistics, okay, for example, here, literature, it does not mean to, you know, uh, to focus on any particular era only, definitely will focus on linguistic features which are involved in the production of literature, plus uh, philosophical considerations of any particular kind of work and the sociological issues which were going on in that particular era. So basically, a theory is a very broader term it covers all these aspects so it is not only about the beliefs and you can say you're thinking about the author about the reader or the text definitely it it uh, is a broader term and it covers a wide range of uh, topics under it so basically this theory is an umbrella term okay theory challenges the conception of the author's intention that the meaning of work or speaker is what he had in mind so basically, my dear students, uh, uh, he here uh, we are going towards uh, one more direction, which is uh, what are basically the purposes of creating the theory or of formulating a theory. So basically, theory challenges the conception of author's intentions. So basically, what is basically in 
author's mind uh, theory you know challenges all those things uh, that the meaning of work or speaker is what he had in mind so basically here speaker is the author okay so what is in his in his mind okay by keeping his uh, you know member resources of his mind so we'll analyze the theory so theory would provide the basis to the reader to analyze any kind of work by keeping in view any particular domain all right it also challenges the literature in a representation of life. So, my dear students, theories are made to challenge some things. So, my dear students, here it also challenges that literature is a representation of life. So, here we are coming up with a concept that literature is life. So, I would like to go back to the first lectures, fine, where we just said that literature is based on imagination. This is about life, okay? So, my dear students, here we are relating the same concept over here fine for example when we say that literature is a representation of life so definitely it is not something which is only based on imagination it has some realistic elements in it as well okay whose truth is outside of itself so my dear students here in this representation its truth is uh, you know outside of itself in history or biography etc so my dear students here we have uh, two examples one is of history and the other one is of biography it further challenges the very notion of reality as something present at a given moment. So, my dear students, it uh, again, theory is a name of challenge. So, it challenges, uh, you know, the very notion of reality as something present at a given moment. So, my dear students, uh, reality is what is at a present, uh, you know, right now, fine. So, here basically it uh, challenges the notion of reality as well, okay. In this all around critique of common sense, theory insists that all that passes in the name of natural or essential or universal is nothing but a construction of social practices, a production of certain discourse. So, dear students, here you can see like it would question the common sense, plus it insists that all that, that, all that passes in this name of natural or essential or universal is nothing. So basically this is a, you can say a rejection of uh, the modernism here like there is nothing universal, there is nothing natural or there is nothing essential. So my dear students here you can see like uh, he, here we are talking about criticism so that is uh, one of the product of uh, post-modernism here okay. But uh, you know this uh, uh, you, co you could see over here that this is a construction of social practices okay a production of a certain discourse. So my dear students what reality is according to theory or according to postmodernism that is a construction of social practice. So my dear students here you could see like language is also involved in the construction of reality in the construction of what is basically happening in the society. A production of a certain discourse. So my dear students here we are talking about uh, you know uh, all that passes in the in the name of natural okay this is basically reality okay so this is a production of a certain discourse so my dear students again I'm telling you what basically discourse is discourse is language in action language in you so my dear students when we talk about political discourse or religious discourse so you could see like that is reality so reality is a production of uh, you know certain discourses in the society so my dear students here you could see like uh, we are coming up with the relationship of language literature and society okay both both are you know part and part parcel for each other okay so dear students by keeping in view the major theme of theory plus postmodernism so my dear students here you could see like we are going towards the study of criticism here in the postmodern era okay broadly color makes the following four points to sum up the activity called theory so basically as we were previously talking about color's point of view about you know theory so he uh, broadly speaking he summed up his point of view in uh, you know different points over here okay number one it is interdisciplinary as I told you the theory is not just restricted to one particular discipline if we are talking about literature so that is not only literature psychology is also involved in it sociology is involved anthropology is involved in so this is an interdisciplinary approach towards uh, studying literature or analyzing literature all right it is interdisciplinary always driving ideas or leaving effects outside and original discipline so basically there is a, an original discipline but it has some effects on other disciplines as well so that is why we can say like theory is you know an interdisciplinary approach okay 
it is analytical and speculative uh, always working out what is involved uh, or implied in a text or language or meaning or subject etc so my dear students here you can say like it is analytical and it is speculative as well so here it gives you a margin to you know uh, analyze the text okay and the hidden forces behind the text along with the language or meaning or subject matter so my dear students this is another very important point as far as a theory is concerned it is interdisciplinary it is analytical okay it is a critique of common sense as we were talking about uh, it before as well like uh, this is a critique on the common sense always questioning whatever is considered a given or natural or essential or universal so basically this is relevant to common sense assumptions as well so it always questions what is objective what is universal what is essential or what is natural so what are basically mm, uh, the things which are attached with making it uh, universal or uh, making it natural or essential so basically it uh, rejects uh, like criticism over here it rejects the idea of objectivity of universality or of uh, naturalism all right so my dear students here you could see like it is thinking about thought always inquiring into categories and concepts we use in making sense of things okay such as what is uh, women or man or meaning or tax etc so my dear students here you can see like this is a thinking process theory developing a theory that is not something static this is an ongoing process and this is a thinking about thought okay so it uh, it basically uh, tells you like the ways due to which we categorize uh, certain things okay for example like we categorize our concepts uh, for example about women about um, man or about meaning or text so the information present in the work by color and the page number is 15 okay my dear students so these are the you know four points which you have to keep in mind Uh, when you talk about a uh, theory so this is uh, basically uh, an activity this is an ongoing process this is an interdisciplinary approach this is analytical and this is a critique of common sense so these are the basic points which you have to keep in mind when we talk about theory okay or post modern criticism okay critics like terry eagleton a well known british marxist critic may find in theory an expression of democratic impulse and a liberation so my dear students here you have an impulse of you know democracy and of liberation in theory okay from the stranglehold of a civilized sensibility so my dear students here you can say like we are talking about civilized sensibility so my dear students here when you talk about theory so you are quite liberal you are quite free so you can uh, create any kind of uh, concept here or you can develop uh, any kind of uh, thinking over here okay the fact of the matter is that it has seriously subverted the value of literature in various ways such as the following okay it has made criticism a jargon ridden writing inaccessible to the common reader as such it is anti democratic so my dear students here you can see like uh, here when we say like uh, j a criticism is a jargon ridden writing only so it is just only uh, you know c uh, to highlight the negative aspects of uh, anything okay or you know this is uh, a complete uh, you, you can say isolated genre so if we do not add it in literature so definitely we call it a jargon ridden writing okay that is inaccessible to the common reader as well so everybody can not read criticism although they do have an access to novels to poetry to dramas but they cannot read you know uh, criticism as such as such it is anti democratic so my dear students here you could see like uh, uh, the element of democracy are not present over here because uh, a piece of literature that be, that should be uh, easily accessible to everybody in the society so they here this approach is quite anti democratic it has reduced literature to the status of a speech so my dear students here you could see like speech on that can be written or spoken so here it is just delimited literature to speech only any speech political uh, pornographic uh, stray writing etc as such uh, it deprives art and literature of uh, their human and ennobling effect so my dear students here like you could see over here like any speech that is relevant to uh, politics or to pornography or straight writing so my dear students they have just have reduced literature to that one 
on the other hand according to different the theories you could see like uh, they are making you know uh, literature as a broader term so this is uh, not only uh, you know restricted to speech but there are certain other aspects which are related to it okay so when we were talking about theory as a as an interdisciplinary approach the same is the case with literature literature is not just restricted to speech or any one genre only so it covers all the aspects okay so these are the two points okay we'll talk about some other as well okay it has reduced literary criticism to dividing people into regions races tribes cultures colonizers and colonized etc as such it is divisive not unifying it has also made criticism a negative activity which is meant to trace uh, faultiness lapses absences what the text uh, does not say or has failed to say so my dear students uh, usually here the concept of uh, negativity is coming over here that is very much important as far as criticism is concerned so my dear students when we talk about criticism usually people think that we try to highlight the negative uh, factors which are involved in the formulation of text or you know the negative aspects of of different characters uh, in a novel or a drama so that is known as criticism so definitely this is an healthy activity it does not mean to highlight the faults or the negative aspects of anything so in the third point when we were talking about literary criticism so you could see like people they have reduced literary criticism to dividing people into different regions races and cultures okay my dear students basically this is not the point when we talk about theory literary criticism or about literature so definitely all these approaches or you can say these concepts are interdisciplinary they are attached with other domains of art as well okay the theory has given birth to a set of approaches so basically this is not only one approach so it has given birth to a set of approaches in criticism which transform the activity of understanding this is understanding the literature plus appreciating it and evaluating it on the basis of your knowledge and experiences a literary work into an activity of self reflection so my dear students here will find out uh, uh, you know subjective element of self reflection over here in uh, literature for example whatever is in your mind so you'll perceive the things in as it is way okay so this is about the member resources of the readers which are involved in interpreting the text those are also very much important it tends to marginalize artist and their artwork so basically this this these are the basic purposes of using or introducing theory in literature so basically so this is uh, to marginalize uh, artist and their artwork so basically the point of focus here is uh, you know art test and uh, has or her work okay my dear students so these are some of the points relevant to theory and then we are moving uh, towards criticism as well so previously before postmodernism criticism was just used to be uh, you know a, a kind of thing where you highlight the negative aspects or you can say the drawbacks or the flaws of any work so here we are going towards uh, another uh, new approach that is uh, the definition of criticism like this is appreciation this is evaluation and uh, this is understanding as well all right theory and its implications so my dear students we took a start with theory and we are, we are moving towards criticism as well so what is basically theory and its implications so when we apply theory one when there is you can say an experiment of theory so definitely it would make it a criticism reading through the vast variety of contemporary critical theories and textual interpretations under the various brand names such as structuralism and post structuralism deconstruction and new historicism cultural studies and feminism minority discourse and post colonialism one is left wondering where the discipline of literary criticism has arrived in our time so my dear students here we have talked about uh, you know different things like post colonial deconstructionism new historicism or cultural studies you could see over here so we are still left blank like where is from where this you know uh, literary criticism uh, has come from okay the alien idioms uh, one encounters the gigantical critical apparatuses one confronts the mind boggling system okay the mind boggling systems one has to comprehend all quickly combined together to create a climate utterly discomforting 
making one unstable even for a temporary stay against confusion so my dear students here when you are confused or you think that you are nowhere while analyzing anything so what would help you that is your literary criticism okay when you go through different alien e idioms uh, like uh, in any kind of literature or you know gigantic uh, critical apparatuses uh, you would face all right uh, the mind boggling systems uh, one has to comprehend you have to comprehend all quickly combined to create a climate utterly discomforting so my dear students when too many aspects are joined together in your mind so definitely you will be uncomfortable of it and you want to seek the answers of certain questions which are not clear in your mind okay so my dear students here you could see like terrorized by the teasing games of the dreadful discourses the common reader instinctively uh, terminates his journey through the dance forestry and uh, returns to his own common sense reading of the literary work of course after his uh, abortive journey through the verbal forest he does not return the same man he comes back sadder but not wiser what leaves him completely known plus are the oracular declarations such as the death of god the death of the author the death of the subject etc mortally afraid of encountering more of such declarations he decides uh, never to seek any critical company for his future journey into the cities of world so my dear students here you could see like the reader is very much confused about the death of the author about the death of uh, you could see god or the death of the subject so basically here you can say these are the teasing games okay which writers uh, they use in order to confuse the readers okay in order to create suspense uh, about like uh, when we were talking about medieval tragedies or the comedy so you could see like uh, the elements of suspense was very much common over there so these are the teasing games when uh, the reader is in search of you know finding out the answers of uh, some questions okay so these games are adopted by you know the writers you most of the time in such a situation it has become imperative for all those who value literature and literary criticism as instrument of education essential for preserving and promoting the humanities of human societies to understand and analyze the factors responsible for effecting this unprecedented change in the nature of literary criticism in our time until the end of the 19th century literary criticism had remained committed to elucidating for the common reader the social and moral significance of literary works and was always written in a literary style as readable as literature himself so basically my dear students here you could see like criticism is also one of the genre of literature when there are certain questions in the minds of the readers and uh, you know the he or she wants to understand and uh, understand the factors which are involved in the formulation of text so basically criticism would give you answers of that one okay so this is you could see like this is one of the genres of uh, literature okay so my dear students here you will see like a literature and literary, literary criticism as instruments of education you could see in this slide essential for preserving and promoting the humanity of human society so my dear students here you can see one concept is very much important that is humanity of human society so basically criticism tells you what is right and uh, what is wrong so basically it uh, it depends upon the critical analysis of the writers here okay this is a kind of commentary on the works of other people as well okay so here my dear students you will have to keep in mind that criticism is not always negative this is productive as well this is to appreciate to understand and to comment on any writing all right note for example the following from st coleridge the characters of a dramatist persona like uh, those in real life are to be inferred by the reader they are not told to him so basically these are you know to be inferred by the reader the reader has to infer all those characters so these are not directly told by the author to the reader okay and it is well worth remarking that shakespeare's characters like those in real life are very commonly misunderstood and almost always understood by different persons in different ways the causes are the same in either case so my dear students here you could see like people uh, perceive or they judge shakespearean characters in whatever way they like to so here why because they, there isn't any uh, clear cut you can say uh, description of the characters in shakespearean plays so my dear students here you could see like uh, this is a uh, uh, an extract from st coleridge's work uh, the name of the work is uh, uh, dramatis persona okay 
so here this is a this is just a comment on you could see like a Shakespearean uh, walk so right if you take only what the friends of the characters say you may be deceived and still more so if that which his enemies say nay even the character himself sees himself uh, through the medium of his character and not exactly as he is so my dear students here you can see like different people they uh, perceive characters in different ways so if uh, somebody is talking about any particular kind of character from uh, you can say any play so definitely that is not always truth okay so my dear students here you can see like if you are if uh, the description is being done by the friend of the character so definitely you will be deceived on the other hand if that description is being done by the enemy of that very character so again that might not be true okay take all together not omitting a shrewd hand from the clone of or the fool and perhaps you your impression will be right and you may know whether you have in fact discovered the poet's own idea by all the speeches receiving light from it and attesting its reality by reflecting it so my dear students you could see over here like uh, the true uh, description of a character that is uh, you know not possible if uh, you know uh, the clear cut description is not available in any play or in any novel okay so definitely here you'll have to take help from your background knowledge of your common sense assumption or so theory would help you in understanding the character so these things are very much uh, common you know as far as novels and uh, uh, different uh, uh, dramas are concerned okay the very first thing one notices here is the use of an idiom readily available to the common reader one also notices that the analogy used for explaining uh, the critical method is taken from everyday human dealings which implies that literature is a representation of life so my dear students here we are not going to talk about something uh, you know out of this world here again we are referring back to the first point that is uh, you know li literature is life okay so my dear students here like uh, by keeping in view real life so you can assume different characters and you can get or infer meaning of different idioms as well okay one notices too how is in a very simple manner one notices too how in a very simple manner the issue of the author's intention has been explained which makes clear that it is available within the text itself and that one does not need to look for it anywhere else including the author as a historical personage so my dear students here you could see like uh, you'll have to find out the answer of uh, you know any uh, question in your mind within the text uh, uh, because that would be explained there in the text so you don't need to go somewhere else to find out the answer of this question that would lie within the text so you will have to keep it in your mind okay a drastic change in the nature of criticism began to become noticeable in the early years of the 20th century so as I told you like basically this criticism is a product of the 20th century okay those who brought about this change includes uh, I.A. Richards, Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot and the new critics with them literary criticism changed from art to science so my dear students here we are going into another domain that is literature is not uh, you know an art this is a science perhaps it had to change with the increasing influence of science in the modern age so basically you could say like uh, this is a product of the modern age uh, due to you know um, the influence of uh, science okay as W T Stairs has observed the positive stage is the stage of science which when fully attained abolishes both metaphysics and theology in the golden age of the future with which the triumph of science is to usher in nothing will be considered knowledge unless it is science so my dear students here you can say like our focus is on the advancement of science like uh, in future nothing would be considered uh, you know authentic or applicable if it is not science so basically this is uh, the point of uh, you know literary criticism as well okay read for example the following from Ezra Pound the proper method for studying poetry and good letters is the method of contemporary biologists okay my dear students over so here you could see like uh, in order to uh, study poetry and good letters that is a method of contemporary biologists 
that is careful first hand examination of the matter the continual comparison of one slide or specimen with another thus uh, so my dear students here you could see like uh, in order to understand poetry or good letters or any other kind of uh, literature you can see like uh, according to Ezra Pound this is uh, you can say uh, a work of uh, you know or a method of a contemporary biologist thus was adopted by Pound as well as by those new poets and critics who faithfully followed the dictates of this poet's poet and critics critics so my dear students here you can say like uh, two terminologies one is poets poet and the other one is critics critic okay the method of science in poetry and criticism so basically that was uh, basically the method of uh, science in poetry and criticism as well okay so there is always a poets poet and there is always a critics uh, one more critic okay a similar so my dear students here you can see like uh, we are talking about criticism like uh, in order to appreciate any work or in order to criticize any work uh, so uh, critic is very much you can say important over here okay so definitely a poet can um, can uh, you know uh, write any kind of poetry by keeping in view or by imitating the previous poets okay or here you can say a word of criticism can be further criticized by another critic as well okay a similar thrust in the direction of science was given by I.A. Richards who in his science and poetry pleaded once again for the scientific method of analyzing the working of the poem as well as the poet's mind so my dear students here we are going towards another domain domain in uh, analyzing literature like uh, there must be some kind of uh, scientific methods in order to analyze poetry or in order to analyze poet's mind so this is basically I I.A. Richard's uh, point of view about poetry or about criticism okay my dear students like there must be some kind of uh, uh, you know scientific formulas or scientific methods uh, for analyzing poetry or poet okay for example the following to understand what an interest is we should picture the mind as a system of very delicately poised balances a system which so long as we are in health in constant is is constantly growing so my dear students here we are saying that uh, you know we should picture the mind as a system so here again a scientific approach towards uh, the study of poetry or other forms of literature every situation we come into disturb some of these balances to some degree these the ways in which they swing back to new equipoids are the impulses with which we respond to our situation and the chief balances in the system are our chief interest so basically according to our interest we read any kind of poetry this is the point here suppose that we carry a magnetic compass about in the neighborhood of power magnets suppose that we carry on arrangements of many magnetic needles large and small swings so that they influence one another so my dear students here you could see like uh, in this example we have compared you know criticism with other genres or with other fields of literature as well so here basically they are swinged together so they influence each other as well so my dear students history of uh, you know uh, poet uh, that is also very much important and you could see like uh, the background knowledge or you can say the brought up of the reader is also very um, much important in analyzing any kind of work that is why criticism is very much complicated as compared to other genres of literature okay so my dear students here you can you can see the mind is not unlike such a system if we imagine it to be incredibly complex the needles are our interest so my dear students this is just like a like a system the our mind is just like a system okay and uh, which is uh, complex as well and there are some needles which are our interest thus from Pound's scientific method we move to Richard's scientific system my, so my dear students previously we have discussed uh, you know Ezra Pound's uh, scientific method so here we right now we are on you know uh, Richard scientific system in the convention of criticism from Aristotle to Arnold there used to be approaches to literature based on the social and uh, ethical goals of human society they considered literature as an instrument of education so my dear student you could see like uh, from Aristotle to Arnold you could see like they have uh, you know uh, based uh, literature on different approaches okay and according to some social and ethical goals of human society during that period you can say in every era literature is uh, used as a form of education in order to promote education in the society okay now with the high modernist it got reduced to the status of material production of science and industry the most influential of these high priests of scientism is T.S. Eliot who carried this task with greater force than even Pound and 
uh, Richards. So, my dear students, we previously we were talking about uh, Ezra Pound's, you know, um, scientific method. So then we moved towards uh, Richards' uh, scientific system. So, my dear students, here you can see, like, we are going to talk about uh, one more critic. Uh, the name of the critic is T. S. Eliot. So, we talked about. Um, you know his poetry as well okay so T.S. Eliot carried his thoughts with greater force than even Pound and Richardson so there is one uh, there is a name of one more critic T.S. Eliot so my dear students we talked about uh, his poetry in uh, quite uh, uh, a lot of detail okay in the previous lectures not for instance the following there remains to define this process of depersonalization and its relation to the sense of tradition it is in this uh, depersonalization that art may be said to approve the condition of science. So, my dear students, uh, objective uh, element of science uh, here, we're discussing it like that is depersonalized, okay? So, that is like uh, we are going to apply it in literature as well. So, this is there is an element of depersonalization uh, and its relation to the sense of tradition as well, okay? I shall therefore invite you to consider as suggestive analogy the action which take takes place uh, when a bit of finally filiated platinum is introduced into a chamber containing oxygen and uh, sulfur dioxide so my dear students here you could see like uh, some scientific formulas are present over here so this is just an example uh, when while doing comparison of uh, criticism with uh, science okay here the poet's mind becomes the gas chamber so my dear students you could see the metaphor of gas chamber over here like the poet's mind is like a gas chamber in which various experiences combine like different chemicals to form a new compound so basically certain experiences are there in the poet's mind so his mind is just like a gas chamber so uh, basic uh, basically the point is that like uh, various uh, experiences when they combine together in his mind so in order to formulate a new compound okay the chemical reaction is used to explain the process of composition of a poem or any other literary test so my dear students this is a, a call a chemical reaction so when we talk about chemical reaction so this is basically the process of composition of a poem or any other literary text no doubt this conversion of literary criticism into a study of system and structures principles and processes involved in the making of literature is affected under the express influence of sciences so basically here we are comparing criticism with the science like the processes and the principles which are involved in the formulation of scientific formula those uh, those are same here okay so basically my dear students here uh, you know a uh, you can say like criticism or you can say literary writing those are very much affected by the uh, you know science all right in the same way, in the new critics, namely John Crow, uh, Ransom, uh, Cleanth, Brooke, W.K. Wimsatt, uh, Monroy Beardsley, and uh, William Emerson viewed a poem as a structure of words. So basically, according to these uh, new critics, this poem is just uh, a structure of words, reducing the function of criticism to explicating the functioning of various, uh, you know, verbal devices such as metaphor, ambiguity, paradox, irony, image, etc. In the working of the structure uh, called points. So my dear students, these devices are very much involved in structuring the poem okay so in this new critical effort while literature changed from being one of the beautiful arts into one of the functional sciences literary criticism changed uh, from being an educational source into a scientific method so basically when we change you can say the position of literature over here and we make it uh, a functional science so ultimately it would change the function of the literary criticism as well and we are calling it a scientific method over here okay in its attempt to introduce scientism in literature and literary criticism, the modernist uh, criticism in the early 20th century also made the author invisible. So basically, where is the author that is invisible in you know, the modern literature? Okay, that is the early uh, part of the 20th century. For like the filament of platinum, he does not go into the compound called poem. He just stays behind. So my dear students here, you could see like, that was a tradition in the first half of the 20th century that really the poet had to stay behind the poem okay it also made the business of criticism a specialist job it became inaccessible to the common reader who would not have the benefit of knowing various sciences and their principles and processes systems and structures so basically my dear students it was not uh, possible for a common reader of that time to understand literature due to an influence of science on it and uh, you know that was an interdisciplinary approach as well so my dear student that was all about uh, 
you know the criticism in the first half of the 20th century okay the very language of literary criticism acquired a special ring becoming far removed from the language of everyday conversation so my dear students here you can say like a language of criticism is uh, you know very much uh, different from the everyday conversation okay the language of the everyday conversation here the macro commentaries of earlier criticism were replaced by the micro explication of verbal devices used in the making of a poem. The writing called criticism became difficult. Okay, W. B. Yeats, who called himself uh, uh, one the last romantics, uh, soon realized that uh, a roundedness of modern poetry and of modern criticism. So basically. With the passage of time, as I told you, that uh, uh, poetry was also becoming complicated with the passage of time. So, my dear students, here you can see, like, uh, according to him, uh, like poetry and uh, you know modern criticism, those are very much uh, complicated and very much difficult to understand as well. So, this is uh, what uh, you know uh, W. B. Yeats said. Okay. In a letter to Dorothy Wellesley, he separated himself from the high modernists. So, my dear students, here, like uh, W. B. Yeats, he was uh, uh, a modern writer. So, basically, when he, he wrote a letter to Dorothy, so you could see, like, he separated himself from the high modernist. The difficult work which is being written everywhere now has the substance of philosophy and is a delight to the poet with his professional pattern. But it is not your road or mine, and ours is the main road. The road of naturalness and swiftness, and we have dirty centuries upon our side. We alone can think like a wise man, yet express ourselves like the common man. So, my dear students, this was basically his point of view when he separated himself from the high modernists. So, basically, he was trying to say, like, a criticism or literature that is a, a substance of philosophy, and you can say that is very much uh, difficult, and we could not see the element of, uh, you know, natural uh, things or uh, you know uh, the soft attitude that is not found in poetry or in criticism so this, this is basically his point of view about literature okay so my dear students here we are moving towards criticism today okay we we talked about uh, yeats as well and many other you know critics uh, uh, in the history of english literature okay criticism today has been taken over by the disciplines of philosophy and psychology sociology and anthropology entirely changing the parameters of reading literary work so my dear students here as i told you at the start of the lecture today as well like criticism is an interdisciplinary approach so this is basically a combination of philosophy psychology of anthropology of sociology as well okay so here we are entirely changing the parameters of you know uh, uh, reading literary works we no longer look for aesthetic or moral grounds for the appreciation of a, an artwork we look for the subtext and substructures for faultiness and uh, fictographs using the operators borrowed from one of the disciplines just mentioned so my dear students here you could see like uh, we here comes the element of uh, uh, intertextuality here okay the uh, the text the other texts which are involved in the formulation of the text or the importance of context which is involved so this is not only text which is being analyzed here in the in the criticism today but the other things other domains other fields uh, of literature which are closely associated with analyzing uh, literature over here those are very much important so this is basically the essence of the criticism today okay reason why this has happened is convincingly started by Northrop Fry in the following so my dear students uh, just focus on this uh, quotation right now it is clear that the absence of systematic criticism has created a power vacuum so my dear students here uh, basically I'm telling you the interdisciplinary nature of uh, criticism today okay the current critical efforts refuses to decide upon any goal of literature or literary criticism beyond the contingent. It is high time that resistance was put up to the confusing critical cries of our time, paving the way for the restoration of every abiding goal of literature and literary criticism. So, my dear students, here you can see again we are uh, going back to you know uh, the concept which was uh, given by Michael Foucault, like there when there is power, there is resistance. So, my dear students, here you can see this is. Uh, high time of uh, resistance and uh, you know when you are confused when you want to uh, seek answers of uh, something which is in, uh, there in your mind so definitely then you'll have to criticize something okay so basically you'll have to find out the answers of uh, you know any kind of question by reading the you know uh, 
critical uh, you can say um, works of uh, that era as well so my dear students this is basically the restoration of the every abiding goal of literature and literary criticism so my dear students here you could see like we have entered into entirely a new approach of uh, uh, reading literature and of criticism so my dear students here this is an interdisciplinary approach uh, we uh, we mix uh, too many you know disciplines together here we cannot uh, just study literature we cannot just uh, criticize literatures in terms of you know text only the things like anthropological factors which are involved in the formulation of text the sociological factors for example the linguistic features which are attached with that so we'll have to analyze everything so my dear students this was uh, all about uh, post uh, modern criticism so i hope you are getting the things uh, in a good way okay my dear students so that was all about uh, you know post modern criticism and we talked about like how this uh, has uh, you know become an entirely a new approach in the history of english literature because uh, the the other disciplines which are attached with it so we cannot study literature or you know literary criticism uh, as a thing only so here you could see like the different fields which are attached with the you know post modern criticism those are very much important so in order to analyze the post modern literature so you'll have to keep in mind literary theory and you know the domains or you can say the concepts of post modernists over here okay my dear students hope to see you again with the, another lecture relevant to history of english literature have a nice time allah hafiz